Okay, hello guys, and welcome to this month's Code Harbor. Whoa. Every time I do that, I don't know why. Um, so we're going to jump straight in with our first talk from, oh, this is going to be such a long one, Interim Head of Technology Transformation at Klein, a management consultancy, Duncan Lowey? I never actually asked you how you pronounce it. Is that right? Lowey. Lowey. Ah. Near enough. Oh. <laughs> Uh, he's going to give a talk for us on DevOps applied systems thinking. So away you go. Thank you, Alex. Uh, let's just make sure I'm sharing again. Okay, so DevOps and systems thinking, two nice big concepts, big chunky concepts. How do I fit them into a 25 minute talk? By putting the word applied in the middle and see if we can narrow the topic down a little bit and, and, and talk about some precise things. And why on earth do I want to talk about DevOps anyway? Well, I would say that um, I've spent 25 or so years in my IT career so far, and I spent a lot of that time believing that um, to what, that I'd learned things, that I knew how things worked, and that um, when new stuff came along, it was just consultants trying to whitewash the world with some new cool thing. And I thought very much the same when I first heard of DevOps. But one of the things that I realized as I got myself a bit further into it was a discovery that actually DevOps is something that can help us with the way that we work and to change the way we work. And, and if we do it right, actually help us um, be happier in the work that we do and the results that we deliver from that work. Uh, I'm gonna to talk today a couple of minutes about DevOps as a buzzword, uh, the core idea of the three ways, um, people and teams, which I think is the core of anything successful, some of the ways you can measure DevOps and some of the things that are the kind of next steps. Now, DevOps is a buzzword. I mean, I already mentioned that um, you know, it can, it can be the kind of things that consultants use or that anybody uses. And in fact, when I went and looked, um, looked around the job sites recently, I found that apparently there's over 10,000 jobs on LinkedIn that have the title DevOps in currently posted. Now that tells me that there are a lot of people who are using the word, possibly without understanding what it actually means. Um, or, and you know, some of these people are go with people who used to be called engineers and before that they were called developers. Maybe once upon a time, they were even called programmers and they've just been changing the job titles without changing what actually happens underneath. And what actually happens underneath really matters. And if you go and do Google DevOps, these are the kinds of things that you actually you get back from it. Um, I love the fact that one of those is the question of is DevOps dying? Because that tells you that something's actually being successful if people are worrying that it's not cool anymore. Um, my view of is DevOps a job? is that it's a skill rather than a job. It's a capability, it's, it's how you do a job, it's not a job in itself. Um, but again, one of those things that tells you it's, that it's gone over ground and that people are worried that, they're, that, that it's getting boring is when you come up with biz DevOps, DevSecOps, Agile and DevOps. But again, to my mind, um, these are actually ways of people trying to describe the fact that DevOps is actually systems thinking, that it's bigger, a bigger topic than just DevOps and that doing DevOps well is a way of, is, is all of these things and more. But if we go back to the start of things, we talk about the three ways. And the three ways came from uh, the Phoenix Project, a book as the subtitle says, which is a novel about IT DevOps and helping your business win. It was published in 2013. Um, so it's, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth now, but it does provide an, a, still an excellent foundation for people who are unfamiliar with the topic. And the three ways of DevOps uh, are at the core of that. Strangely enough, the first one is systems thinking. It fits there because it makes it obvious why we call it DevOps. It's about putting dev and ops together. And this is something that is key, um, that tends to be more visible in larger organizations that as an organization grows, you end up with development, development groups who have different goals from the operational groups, that your developers need change, that your ops guys want stability. And you need, to, you need to use systems thinking and think about what the overall goal is for, the, for, for all of development and all of ops, for all of IT, to deliver something that actually fits together for the benefit of the business. The second element is amplifying feedback loops. And those feedback loops, um, you know, traditionally, we tend to think of development then going down a waterfall towards your operational organization and changing that, balancing that back more towards the horizontal so that things that happen on the operational side act, impact your development focus as well. 
And as you expand that out, you're actually ensuring that there is more feedback. You're understanding the system better and doing a better job of, of managing the whole system rather than just parts of the system. And continual uh, experimentation and learning. Now, you know, continuous improvement has been with us for decades. Uh, in a sense, this is just the same thing. And, and in the core of this, it's about thinking about how you actually learn from what you've done. I, I definitely, in parts of my career, I spent several years in an organization where at the end of every project, we would have a lessons learned. And everyone would sit down and write down the lessons learned. And at the end of the next project, we would get the lessons learned section. And I would just pull out the piece of the document I'd written for the previous one and supply it again, because we were not learning any lessons. And we could, and I could just give them back the same thing. There was no actual learning process. Uh, there was no real feedback going on. But once you, actually, once you can do these things, you really can change your organization. That's very brief. Um, in a sense, this is a little bit like your, all the best Zen koans. It's very simple to see and read and perhaps initially understand. But the way that you change yourself and your organization to deliver these kinds of things is potentially rewarding. It's not quick. It's a, it's a, it can be a fascinating process. And you will learn a lot about yourself and the place you work as you, as you attempt to improve these kind of implement these kind of skills and capabilities. But to focus back on the systems thinking element again. Now, to my mind, I like this visualization, the idea that systems thinking is about the whole of the jigsaw and about the individual jigsaw pieces. You can't build a jigsaw, you can't put your jigsaw together unless you pay attention to each one of those and how they fit next to the other. But you also can't, or you're not likely to finish a jigsaw unless you also look at the picture on the box and think about how all those components fit into the bigger picture. And the key part, and as I've mentioned before, um, is people, people and teams. And that starts with people. And one of the things that I have had said to me for many years, I remember this from early in my career uh, when I was contracting in a large bank and someone said to me very loudly and quite possibly pointing her finger at me, this is a blame-free organization. And I knew she didn't mean it. I knew that this wasn't how things worked. And, but really, it took me a very long time to understand what we really mean by being blameless or blame-free. I mean, if you just look at this pair of characters, I think I can see one of them blaming, and I think the, I can see the other one being blamed. And this is the kind of behavior that we need to deal with to, to reduce um, this kind of problem if you're working at blame-free blame or blamelessness. And fundamentally, when you're blaming, you, you're going to in, create defensiveness and avoidance in other parts of the organization. I know someone who uh, left a company because his manager demanded that they blame a team outside his group whilst they fixed the problem. They knew it was their fault, but if they could throw the blame somewhere else, they could solve the problem and then look like the heroes. And that is an incredibly bad and un, unconstructive method of behavior. And on the other side of the coin, if you are blaming, and, and this, is it's, this is possibly the harder thing for me to learn. When you are blaming, you're actually providing yourself with an excuse to do nothing. It's their fault, it's their problem, it's up to them to fix it. And bringing yourself to a place where you're thinking about what went wrong, not who went wrong, and what happened rather than who did it. You can think more about how you might solve the problem rather than solve the people. And you know, there's also worth thinking, and I think I got this from um, Google's SRE concepts originally, about how anything where it's a fat finger problem or something that looks like a human problem is at least in part likely to be a systems problem, something that is not protecting the user from bad behavior or um, not protecting them from, from a, a misconfiguration or something like that. So blaming people or blaming users is really counterproductive. Uh, instead, if you get past that, you can get into a place where you have a better system of teamwork and the team can move the biggest boulders together. But what do teams look like? I mean, this is a handball team. And as you can see, each of, well, it's most of two handball teams. And as you can see, each of those players has a different role to play and they do something else to make the team work. And again, what I've found in large organizations is that we end up building a different kind of configuration. We put 
all of those goalkeepers into the same team because they have similar functional skills. And then what we do next is we think, well, actually the football goalkeeper is quite like the handball goalkeeper and we put them into the same team. And so you might end up with your database administrators all in the same team and not working together or not working with the people whose databases, whose data they're actually managing. And if you're not careful, you go from then there to um, putting the wicket keeper in the same team because he looks a bit same. So you've then put your administrators for your big data configuration into the same bit of the organization. And these are different teams with different purposes. You know, a cricket team uh, looks very different from a handball team. A nice day at Canterbury looks quite different from an indoor arena where you're playing handball. And you need to recognize this and focus on what the work is you're doing rather than the function of the individual people in that team. And you build a team that supports that, that business function rather than building a team that's based on uh, putting people with common skills together. My idea of what good looks like uh, comes primarily from this book, Team Topologies by Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pace. And their view of things, um, if I build it up a little bit, is that if you're starting a new organization or a new business function, then you might begin with a single team. And as that team grows, perhaps it's a startup with a bit of success, you find that different skill sets start to settle out of that team. So your feature team will be your main set of programmers who are doing the um, business analysis, writing the code, delivering the product, those kinds of things. And then perhaps you think you need a test manager to focus on that element, or you need a cloud expert to put things into production, or you need a quant, someone with specific skills in statistics and so forth to deliver that particular element of the functionality. And a second team, team comes along and maybe they look a bit different. They don't, don't need those specialist quant skills, but you kind of think maybe the auto scaling expert looks a bit like your cloud expert. Maybe your compliance person looks a bit like your test manager. And if you're not careful, or if you're in an organization that's been around for more than 10 or 20 years, you almost certainly end up with this kind of waterfall approach, this shape to your team. Now, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I think that that's not going to help flow, not going to help get your system working as a whole. And instead, as uh, Skelton Pace described in the book, you, there are four kinds of teams and they don't need to be the same amongst them. They don't need to, do, to have the same shape. They can look like a cricket team or a handball team. But in the, in the essence, your most common kind of team is going to be the streamer line team. This is a team that's focused on business functionality, whether it's delivering a great website or supplying um, mortgage tools to a customer or something completely different. They understand the business function that they're a part of, and they work from one end of that business function to the other, uh, rather than being sliced up into the middle. You have your complicated subsystem team, like the quants that I mentioned earlier, um, or maybe you end up with some people like data scientists who are focused on very specialized skills, but they need to still be aligned with a single business function team, not to be spread across the organization. Then you have enabling teams. So these enabling teams on the left are the kind of teams who support your, your, your business functionality teams. Your business function teams probably don't want to have to work out how to upgrade Jenkins or how to move from uh, um, subversion to Git or things like that. And so an enabling team allows that uh, stream aligned team to focus on the business functionality and not on the underlying technology that they're working with. And the fourth kind of team is a platform team um, who are actually who are delivering to all the other teams. Your enabling team is going to be relying on, on cloud or on-prem, more and more on cloud in just the same way as the other teams are. And whilst these teams might look different, um, they are also func biz you know, business function aligned. Your enabling team is, is, it has a customer who is stream aligned teams. Your platform team has customers across the rest of the organization. And they need to think about what they do in terms of that end-to-end -end view of what their product is rather than on their narrow function. And as you scale as an organization, you don't make teams bigger and bigger. You stick with the old two pizza rule. Uh, you don't have teams bigger than you can feed in, with two pizzas. And so you, have, you, you break down your business functionality into streams that make sense. Perhaps you need an extra enabling streams. Perhaps you need to split your platform team out so that they're delivering neater slices of functionality that fit within 
the cognitive load of a single team. I love the term cognitive load. Um, if it doesn't make, you know, and it's probably worth first five minutes on its own, but I will pass over it for now and hope that it makes some sense to you as a word. Because I really want to talk about measures. And this is the kind of conversation that might, uh, this might work even better if we're actually, actually in a pub. Because growing up in Australia, I knew as a Queenslander that when I wanted a beer in a standard size, I ordered a pot, a pot of beer. And in your, if, you, if I crossed the border into New South Wales, exactly the same amount of beer had a different name. If you went far enough south, it went back to pot. I have no idea why. These are just the kind of rules you get. This is the, the tacit knowledge. And the interesting thing here is that if you go to South Australia, it's called a schooner. And when it, does it become disastrous? It becomes disastrous because a South Australian has, gets a different amount of beer in a schooner or a pint to anyone else in Australia. So you end up with a, prob a huge problem here. How is this relevant to the conversation? If you're not measuring the same thing, if you're not using the same, same talking about the same things when you measure stuff, you're creating difficulty for your organization to, act, to measure consistently and to deliver results. And that can be extremely problematic. If, if one team says they delivered 10 schooners worth of business uh, and they're a South Australian team, they delivered a lot more, a lot less than someone from Western Australia or Victoria, just for example. Now, when I came to the UK, I discovered that beer came in some pretty weird colors, but it comes in two standard sizes and everyone knows how much is a half pint and how much is a pint. And, they, and we can get onto the more interesting topics of, of bitter and lager and things like that. Um, whereas in Australia, it's all almost, well, when I was growing up, it was almost all lager. Um, and it was just the sizes that were strange. Now, there are other things about metrics that can hurt. And that's the way that you actually put them together. And let me talk about some four, four measures of ways that metrics can hurt. Are you describing an output or an outcome? An output might be how much effort you put in. You know, it took us 100 hours to do this piece of work. Now, that's valid, important information for certain parts of the organization. But for your clients, for your people outside the team, they probably want to know what the outcomes are. How many requirements did you actually deliver? Not how much work did each requirement take? Secondly, does the number reflect reality? Three or four years ago, I was just starting to introduce DevOps into a large organization. And what I found was that we just didn't have the tools in place to do it. So I said, I know, let's do a survey. Let's ask people, how DevOps are you? And what I found was that people think they're more DevOps on a sunny Friday afternoon than they do on a wet Tuesday morning. And the people had no idea what they said three months ago when you asked them again. And so there was no genuine reflection of reality in, in the answers to those survey questions. And what we found instead was that we had to move, to move towards telemetry, to measuring the systems themselves rather than measuring people's opinion about the systems. And once we agreed common telemetry, uh, there, was a, there was a certain amount of work, there's a massive amount of work required to implement that. But it did give us real numbers that were consistent across the organization. And so therefore it started reflecting reality. It's also important to make sure you're measuring something that you can impact. And let's go to the Bank of England. There's probably not much point in measuring the interest rate, for example, because you or I, most companies are not going to change the interest rate or impact it. But measuring something you can actually do, such as your service, uh, service availability, and you know that when, if you spend more time and effort on certain aspects, you'll get different results, it makes it a valuable thing to measure. And finally, what action does the information drive? Um, this is the whole problem of gaming the system. And the, the, my traditional example here goes back to lines of code and measuring lines of code. I think most people agree that it's a poor metric these days. And that in fact, your best day might be the day when you actually refactor or remove redundant code and reduce your number of lines of code by hundreds of lines. But if you're rewarding people based on how much code they produce, they are going to be inclined towards producing more code, not improving the quality of the code, or by reducing and removing redundant code. So what do good measures look like? 
Well, to my mind, um, this book, Accelerate, is, is actually one of the best books available on the whole DevOps topic. It's based primarily on uh, research on well-managed surveys over several years, uh, written by Nicole Forsker and Jazz Humble and Jean Kim. Um, and the organization that, that Nicole Forsgren, Dr. Forsgren works for is now, I think, part of Google. Uh, and the, there's a huge amount in there about drivers and about systems and about how the whole piece fits together. But at the core of this, uh, for a DevOps part organization specifically, there are four measures. And these four measures measured together, if they improve, um, show overall improvements in business success, whether it's profit or impact, depending on whether you are what, what your primary, primary concerns are. The first of these is deployment frequency. And you know this comes back to the gaming thing. People said to me, but if we just measure, if we want people to deploy more often, they'll de deploy smaller components just to get this number up. And to that, my answer is great, because that's what we're actually trying to do. If you deliver smaller components, you've probably got a better idea of what, what the impact of that component is. You've probably got a better chance of fixing it if it goes wrong or pulling it back if it's gone, if, if something bad has happened. And you, and you can build continual new small amounts of functionality that, actually, that get delivered. The second one is lead time for changes. Uh, this is defined as when the time from when you start coding to the time when it's delivered. It clearly can't count, doesn't count the upstream time, but the, the as the book indicates, as you shrink the lead time for changes, the kind of culture and behavior changes also shrink the upstream time. And why does this matter? Well, if you write code now, but it doesn't go live for six months, there's a pretty good chance that you've moved on to other things, that, you're, that you just don't remember what that code was or what it was for. And even more important than that, the value of your time and effort in that code, the business value is not realized until it's actually available in your production environment. And so that is essentially effort that's sitting on a shelf un with unrealized value. So reducing that lead time for changes benefits both the quality of the code because you're more likely to be able to fix things or understand where you're up to in a process if it goes out quickly and because you're delivering that value sooner. So those are things that development teams tend to care about. On the other side is change fail rate. So if you're deploying a lot and it's failing a lot, then you're not really delivering value. Um, so reducing that change fail rate is one of those things, you know, operationally, um, we, when, I was, when I was in a database administrator, we tried to avoid people deploying because the best way to not change was to be static. Uh, we called it stable but I've realized now it's more static, stuck. And so making changes, but making successful changes is the combination you need. And finally, mean time to restore. I spent a vast proportion of my career trying to reduce the likelihood of failure because when stuff broke, it was incredibly painful and unpleasant to get it back to fixed. And so you just wanted to make sure that nothing broke. If instead you know that you can fix it, you know you can fix it quickly by having run books or automation or redundancy of other kinds in place, then you're, you're going to be more comfortable with failure and with things breaking because you know you can bring it back together. And again, two development changes, two ops changes, systems thinking, and the core of this is that you need to think about all four measures together. You can't improve one at the cost of the other. Uh, because then you're not actually improving your system overall. So to bring me to my concluding section about being more DevOps, um, one thing that I would re strongly recommend that I didn't feel I had time for, but really wanted to mention is value stream mapping. If you want to be more DevOps, look at value stream mapping, understand how your system fits together end to end, where you can automate or eliminate steps that are slowing down your delivery of value. More generally, um, there are plenty of books on these topics. And um, I've mentioned a couple of them as I've gone. All of these books have significant value um, in understanding the terms and working through the ideas of, of what DevOps is and, and what good can look like. One thing I would suggest is don't try to go through walls. Some people have that magic skill, but most of us don't. Instead, Find the people who are doing a good job in your organization and build bridges between them. You will have people who are doing better than average. Half of them have to be, 
And if you can put those people together, you can influence the whole organization to be more constructive, to, to have an outcome of positive deviance. Um, I like the term positive deviance. When you do see success, when you get recipes for success, share those recipes. Everyone else would like to see them and it's a shortcut towards improving what your organization does. Start small and replicate. Don't just grow things into a giant lump, but repeat your solutions across the organization. Keep in mind that idea of small jigsaw pieces that make the whole jigsaw and put the jigsaw together. Keep your eye on outcomes. These kind of, uh, the king penguin just loves to nurture. They want to have eggs under their, under their, under their, on their feet. But this one's carrying a rock. It doesn't matter how long he carries that rock for, he's never going to get a baby penguin out of it. See whether or not you're having the results you look for and see whether or not you need to reassess. That's the essence of continual experimentation and learning. Recognize that some days are just going to be like this. But as you get through them and as you get over them, you can pull together and you can deliver excellent results for the whole of your organization. Thank you. Thank you. That was good, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, and you started a really couple of quite interesting conversations. I don't know if you've seen the chat. Oh, no. Let's see about um, pint glasses and stuff. <laughs> uh -huh. Good. Excellent. Uh, yes, I think. That's Sorry, I was gonna say, I think, uh, so the first question was, I think, Karen, you had a question, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, my comment was about the jugs. I was quite interested in the fact that it was quite consistent at jug level. <laughs> I just wondered whether that was because most people drink at that, that size. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think probably because jugs, actually, I think because jugs are more recent, um, I think traditionally everything was always just the standard. And yeah, you might have noticed that the pot, midi, whatever is actually, a half pint mm -hmm. so and a half pint was very much the standard size for cold fizzy beer before it gets warm and flat <laughs> it was a, definitely interesting yeah my question was um how much importance is attached to um in terms of your so when you're talking about your teams and the mm. you know building a team with with all the different um skills that, that are needed um mm. you know and and your teams being about the the work rather than about a set mm. of skills. Um, I was just wondering how much importance attached to understanding what each other does, you know, each person understanding what all what other people do and therefore that, that kind of, bring, you know, helping the team to work much better together. Yeah, I mean, my feeling is that you're always gonna have a variety of skill levels. You're gonna have some people who um, understand the data better or understand algorithms better. Um, and that they are naturally going to gravitate towards those pieces in the puzzle. But it's about making sure that you stay together as a team. So you recognize each other's best skills, but you ideally, I mean, the same as, um, I mean, you don't, um, you, you normally have more than one striker at a football team. Um, and even, and then one of them might be left foot and one of them might be right footed. But, and so you kind of have some balance of skills that way. Um, I mean, it probably breaks down a bit with my example of goalkeepers and wicket keepers. But if the wicket keeper has to go over the field, someone else has to be able to take over that job. Mm -hmm. So there's an element there of, of you, you, gonna, you might, your second keeper might not be as good as your first, but you have to have someone who can at least put the gloves on. Okay, no, and presumably that, 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 the, uh, that, 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 that knowledge of, of what each other does and those, yeah, having those skills and those interests means that you can, it, it's better for expectations in, ter in terms of the team, in terms of ex ex your expectation of what other people can do in a particular time and, and how difficult that is. And Indeed, and, and most likely you're going to be using some kind of agile process. And if you're doing daily stand-ups or something like that, then you will have an idea of what each other does um, and you will find places where this, where you can maybe if you've got a, a bit less work than you expected in a given sprint or you've got room to to bring an apprentice in in some sense then maybe someone is spending 10 percent of their time um, as your apprentice in in your area 
and vice versa to, to build up those shared skills. And again, if, you, if, if, if the team is understanding a business function, um, they will tend to grow that understanding across their technical skills because they, they share that um, domain language. Um, as I think Eric Evans came up with this domain-driven design um, and they share a larger picture um, that they share also with the business if you're doing this right. So that the business might, you might have, you know, you've got your product owners or people on the, on the requirements side who don't understand the technical bit, but you build again an understanding of, of what you're doing as a business uh, and what your, per what your purpose is so that you can, you can see how, how each, people's, each person's specialism fits into that purpose. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I was just going to add to that as well, Duncan. I, I don't know if you agree with this one, but also the whole idea of, um, you know, the, so one of the ideals of DevOps is focus, flow, and joy. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole idea that as a unit, you enjoy what you're doing. So as a result of that, your team's going to be much more stable than a team that's not very happy in what they're doing and mm -hmm. people are looking to move out of that team or even leave the company. But, but with that, whole concept of focus flow and joy and another ideal which is psychological safety mm. um they they generally tend to mold the teams together for a longevity so I, I don't know whether you agree with that whether that's something that totally and and again that um i mentioned in one of the pictures one of the books in the list was project to product and again if you're focused on long-lived teams and delivering a product that continues to improve and continues to deliver business value um then again, the team is going to have an intention of being together for a long time. You don't have a six month project and everyone gets thrown back into the pool afterwards, or um, you don't have a point at the start of every year where you think about whether you're renewing your contractors and you, you have a bit more of a long-term view. And, and as you say, if there's joy, if, there's, um, if the team is actually playing well together, they're naturally going to share skills um, and, and build understanding of the bigger picture. Awesome. Um, I, I, I had a quick I knew, I knew you were going to ask about something. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, no, uh, I, I think, um, I can't remember if it's, is it the Phoenix Project? Yep. Or is it? Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I listened to the, uh, the audio book version of it um, many years ago. It was absolutely mind-blowing and also terrifying. Uh, one of the things that, um, that I found interesting was the whole kind of theory of constraints upon which uh, a lot of the philosophy is based. And like, I'm interested in how you found, how you discovered the constraints within uh, a system of people that is producing software. Um, and, and also, I guess there's two questions and also like connecting the individuals to those business goals and, and bridging that that gap between like I own this business function and um, IT as he calls it in the book needs to help me deliver this like uh, I don't know that's probably one of the broader questions that I can yeah ask. and um I think I'm going to focus on the second question um, because what I found in a big company was that the constraints were massively rule bound processes and a belief that nothing could change. Um, and in small companies, the constraints are fundamentally the amount of time and money available. Um, and so, and, and from there, I mean, and it's perhaps easier in a smaller company to kind of focus back on, on purpose um, and, and recognizing what is the critical value, what is the value stream. Um, but in terms of connecting IT and the business, um, I still think it's about... Um, finding people i mean there's, there's an element of, of luck there frankly of finding the business person who's prepared to um ask how this works or finding the, the technology person who is a bit more of a bridge but mm. as you kind of but it kind of comes back to positive deviance if you've then got some people who are doing so much better than everyone else and i found this in one organization where um the guys in apac started doing something differently um, and they were they took 25% out of their, their their work time, and the the guys in Europe 
who were nominally part of the same private banking function, but had a completely different management, were like, how come they can do it? Why can't we do it? And the European bit of the organization was essentially saying, because rules. And, um, and, the, and, the, and, and the, the people who actually wanted the business result were saying, we need to do something about those rules because it's stopping us delivering. So actually having that good example um, makes the difference. But there is definitely an element of luck or coaching. I mean, what I'm finding at the moment is a, is a very strong focus on um, finding sympathetic people and giving them the skills. Um, and to some extent, um, it's, for me, it's been a big change too, because I, I, I love the big concept. I like talking about the three ways and all of that kind of stuff. But in fact, I would, and, and focus, flow and joy and the 93 other principles. Um, but but it fundamentally, it actually works better if you give them the breadcrumb they need uh, rather than offering them like a whole bakery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's um, that makes that makes a huge amount of sense. Um, actually, um, thanks for uh, thanks for answering. Cheers. So good to see a DevOps talk without the figure of eight. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I have got some really complicated diagrams in my others, but I've just gone past the figure of eight. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm doing a talk um, later on this month, and, and I, I've actually got a, that one of those like a, so I showed a figure of eight, and then I'm going to stamp it on. <laughs> this, this is not there, <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah. So I, it's funny you talk about the the, the three ways. I, I focus on the five ideals. Right. In the three ways. Well, yeah, it's, maybe I'm still Old Testament because uh, that was um, Gene Kim's first book, and the five and the, uh, the five ideals of Gene Kim's second novel, the, the Unicorn Project. Um, and maybe I just need to update myself a bit and think a bit more about the, the New I'm, Testament. I, I think what it is, he had that ha ha moment. I think he touches on all the five ideals in the first mm. book in, in the Phoenix Project, uh, and certainly the DevOps Handbook as well. But I think he articulates them a bit better in the in the um, unicorn project. Um, yeah, 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 and and I and I think that that's one of the things that all of us with DevOps is that to a certain extent we have to learn the lessons ourselves and make some of the mistakes ourselves um, to actually really understand why some of these things are the way they are. Um, and you know, you can get you can short circuit a whole lot of things by. You know, looking at the patterns and anti-patterns in Jonathan Smart's Sooner, Safer, Happier, for example, um, as recipes. Um, but, you know, that loaf of bread I showed, that wasn't the first time I tried to make that. That was the, way, the time it worked. And so it doesn't matter how good the recipes are. To some extent, you have to learn for yourself mm. how your organization works, you know, what your oven's like, what your kitchen's like, um, to actually make the recipes turn into the results. It's all about the outcome. Indeed. And recognizing that every failure is a step in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the kind of fail fast philosophy is I've always found it interesting from the kind of small business um, perspective where, um, you, like you say, you have got that, that very obvious um, uh, resource uh, kind of, um, your, your resources are very obvious. Mm. and um and very restricted and failing fast it might only be a matter of kind of days spent doing x y and z but when you're looking at kind of keeping that pipeline topped up and delivering on various other projects it, it can be quite um quite tricky to kind of find the the space and the time to innovate um uh, innovate in the way that a big company could like right you guys here's your two pizzas <laughs> um Go and work on that for, for, for six weeks. Yeah, but what I found in big companies is that they don't get anything more done in six weeks than a small team does in six days in terms of getting to the point of failure. Mm. Um, and, and, I th and, and I mean, one of the other examples, I mean, people talk about uh, one of the other things, I can't remember which, where I learned this one, is talking about safe to fail. And so, you're, you know, it's not taking a critical component. Um, mm. It is taking something that is at the edge or new or a small income stream or something that you're playing with rather than um, your primary business and you're learning in, in you know you're learning in the in the in the training ground not actually in in the um, 
on on Canterbury, or, you know, in the in the arena. Yeah, 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 the, yeah. That 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 does that does make a lot of sense, and especially kind of I think like on that onboarding perspective, um, the amount of times that we would have got um, a new dev to kind of work on something that we're like, oh, we've always wanted to do X, but mm you know we can't pull our guys off to 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 do it and it is yeah it then becomes like you say that that sort of safe to fail you know because if, if they if they don't deliver it then well, well we still got a pretty safe uh, mm. kind of business but if they do then well that's that's even better for us yeah absolutely and the team i worked in um last year basically had an onboarding program where um, all of those things in the backlog that were not business critical were just piled up for whenever someone new came in. Hmm. Um, and, you, and some of those things turned into core functionality that that, that new person was the, the worldwide expert in that function. Um, and so they, they, come, they go from being new to the company to being leading something critical within three to six months because they've taken an idea and it's been a success. Yeah. Um, and if, and as you say, if it was a complete failure, then we've learned, um, and they've still learned the systems and the tools and the methodology and how we do feedback and how we, what our coding style is and all that kind of stuff. And then they get to move on to the critical stuff without, um, without feeling that, that the thing they did that didn't work was anything more than an experiment and a learning exercise. Mm -hmm. And the whole, um, the whole ethos of like that, that, right. The absence of fear of failing is, is, a, is a cultural thing. And I think some of the smaller companies that have that culture, they, they sort of started out that that uh, process of, you know, from day one with those minimal viable products. You know, let, let's get this product out there. It's not the best product. We know it's not the best product, but let's go out there and see how it works. Mm -hmm. If it fails, then, it, you know, then we don't need to invest in it. But if it does well, then we'll incrementally improve it until it becomes a bit the best that it can be. Um, but that that is a mindset that that needs to be there from the beginning. I think the larger organisations, from my experience, just don't have that mindset. Um, there's much, especially those that are regulated. They they tend to be much more risk adverse than than that. And you know, and, and I, f I find it really difficult to actually communicate DevOps to those people as well. They 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 just don't get it really. Yeah, it's. I, I, I hate to bring the old super tanker reference in, but I mean, if you can if you can get a one degree angle change into a company that size, you've probably moved as much of the world as you have by turning a small company 180 degrees. Um, at least that's what I tell myself um, before I open another beer. That's a very optimistic view. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> that's a good way. I, I think one of the things around DevOps is it is a much better fit for global companies now where you've got teams that are distributed around the globe. So I, Duncan and I, it appears, worked for the same company for most of our uh, careers up in uh, Canary Wharf. Um, and for a long time, I managed uh, a globally distributed team. And when we first started, we moved our London-based team out to, to Singapore, and there's a lot of new people came in. And the whole of the communication broke down because we used to have a, a centralized team and now we, we'd lost that kind of what, what's known as the cocktail party effect where everybody can overhear what everybody else is doing and you're all familiar with stuff. And until you break it down again into the small functional teams, right? I mean, by the time you've got your pizza in London, you get it to Singapore, it's cold and moldy. So you've yeah. got to have that. So you've got to have the small teams to have the, for the pizza thing to work at all. Um, and, and yeah, breaking it down like that makes DevOps, so DevOps makes those teams work. And I think it's much more applicable to modern development uh, regimes than it, than it ever was before as well. Yeah, and you know, just the mediation of, of having a shared GitHub repository or um, moving to um, Jira or something like that um, so that you don't have to all be in the same place with the same pile of sticky notes on the on the office wall, um, you know that that kind of mediation. I think there's still there's still potentially significant time zone problems. Um, you know the, the the people in Singapore and the people in London. Um, if you're trying to put a stand up between together, um, one of them are telling you what they did that day, and the other lot are telling you what they're going to do that day. Um, for example, um, but you can think about how you parcel out 
um, business functionality and build teams that are focused on, you know, feature teams built, built on built on those kind of things. And they fit together at a different level. Um, and you can make those work. Um, and, you know, we're all in this last year been learning how much you can make work remotely, um, even if your boss is, I mean, you know, my, my manager now is a few miles the other side of Canterbury. Um, you know, it's not like we're, we're meeting up on any kind of regular basis, but we're still getting work done. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to jump, I didn't want to say anything in case anyone was, is it got ugly? Uh, 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 try that again. Do we have any more questions? No? Cool. I don't, I really hate to think that I'm going to stop when people are in the middle of something, so. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and that, and that, thanks for that. That was a much, that was a great conversation too. Yeah, um, I was kind of looking at the time, I was like, I wonder if we can make it so the talk bit is actually longer than your actual talk. <laughs> Oh, that would be co the first. I was kind of curious mm -hmm. to see how long this was going for. It's awesome. <laughs> it's not going to be fun when I have to upload this later and it won't film. <laughs> it will take like six days. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, one sec.